pick my, I've got it written down somewhere in my Bible. It's been, oh, 15 years, going 16, 17 years. I know it's over 16. But I've been out here long enough to tell you, you got to be faithful. <laughs> it's all about faithfulness. And uh, if anything the Lord's taught me out here these 16, 17 years is to be faithful. Because I've been out here when this whole church has been packed out. I've been out here when there's been three people here. I've been out here when it's just been me and my son. <laughs> and that's it. It'll humble you. It'll start, you know, make, make you question your calling. Make you question what you're doing. And what the Lord's got you doing. And it'll, it'll, uh, it, it'll, it'll really make you think. And you just got to be faithful. Now I don't know where everybody. I, the point is, is I don't know. I can't answer for anybody but me. I can't even answer to my, for, for, my, for my wife to the Lord. But I know the Lord wants me here on a Sunday morning. He wants me here on Wednesday night. And that's where you'll find Keegan Hall. I, I really believe with all my heart you'll find me out here. And if you want to rob my house, that's the best time to go rob it. I'll, that's where I'll be, guys. I'll be out here. But the point is, is that uh, just be faithful. Faithfulness produces fruitfulness. If you'll be faithful, the Lord will produce fruit. I know that. So. Thank God that we're here this morning. I thank the Lord for the rain He sent our way. Praise God. And look, at, look at 17, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me. Now remember, there were seven vials. This is the last of the, the, uh, the, last of the judgments, the seven vials. And he's poured out the seven vials. So... What we're, what we're having here in Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 18, is this, there's, a par, there's a parenthesis going on here. There's a little pause in ch ch chapter 17 and 18, and then 19 is going to pick up where Jesus Christ comes back. But in 17, the angel that's pouring out that seventh vial, he came and talked with John, and he's saying unto me, Come hither, I'm going to show, you, uh, show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have made, been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me, the angel carried John, away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness, of a fornication. Here's a picture of Clarence Larkin's view of that. There's so many different artists that did so many different uh, drawings of this, of this scripture that we're reading here. It's hard to kind of put a picture of this. This is a black and white. He drew this about 1917 of the horse sitting on the beast. It's got seven heads. It's got the ten horns. And here's another picture. This is more of a modern day picture of a lady sitting there, of the horse sitting there, the woman. And he's got the seven heads and she's got the golden cup. And it says there in verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, all caps, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Those are 13 words that are capitalized right there. Watch out for that number 13. And then verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Now, when you read verses 1 through 6, it's got to be going through your mind. What is this? What in the world's going on here? What's this beast? What's this woman? What's this whore that's sitting on here? And it's describing all that. It's hard to even picture it. You see, I've tried to throw a picture up. Somebody's drawn up here. But it's hard to wrap your mind around it. But what you'll find out a lot of times in the Bible, if you just keep reading, you'll get the interpretation. And here's an example of that. In verse 7, And the angel said unto me, What wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman... And of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. So this morning I want to preach on the mystery solved of the woman and the beast. The, the mystery of the woman and the beast is solved. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just come to you humbly. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I pray, Father, you bless this, this teaching, Lord God. I pray, Father, that you bless these people to come out here this morning, Lord God, to hear your word. And Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us this morning into all truth, Lord. I pray you hide me behind the cross. I pray, Lord, you cover me in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, Lord, that it'll be your words and not mine, Lord. And I pray if there's any picture, any image I throw up here, Lord God, that's not pleasing you, I 
pray, Father, it'll fall on uh, blind eyes, Lord God. Now, if I say anything that's displeasing you, it'll fall on deaf ears, Lord God. I pray for all those, our loved ones, our brothers and sisters, Lord, that weren't able to make it out here to church this morning, Lord God. I pray you bless them wherever they're at, Lord God. And I do pray for some healing in the church. And, Lord, I thank you for your healing hand. I thank you for your grace you've been showing us. This, uh, this last week, just in some answered prayer. And Lord, as we go through the rest of these services, Lord, I pray if there's somebody underneath the sound of my voice that doesn't know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, they'll come on down here and get saved. In Jesus Christ, holy name I pray, amen. All right, so we're going to look at this mystery. And he says, I'm going to show you, this angel tells John, I'm going to show you this mystery, this mystery of the woman and of the beast. So I'm going to show you in verse 8. Turn to verse 8. Keep going to verse 8. The beast, and here's, here's what he's going to describe it. Verse 8, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now we know from our study of the book of Revelation that that beast is the Antichrist. He shows up in Revelation chapter 13. He comes out by the water. And he's described in, in the same way with the seven heads and the, and the ten horns. So that is the Antichrist, what we know to be the Antichrist. But what I'm going to show you here is that there's, a, there's inferences in this chapter, in this verse 8, that Judas might be the Antichrist, or the Antichrist might be Judas returned. Returned. So... In John, now I'm not going to make y'all turn to these because we're going to go quick this morning. But in John chapter 6, Judas is called a devil by Jesus. He said, didn't I choose you 12 and one of you is a devil? And that was referring to Judas. In John chapter 17, Judas is called by Jesus Christ the son of perdition. What makes that inter interesting is there's only two people in the whole Bible called the son of perdition. That's Judas and the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. That's the only two people in the Bible called the son of perdition. Something more, something, nothing interesting about Judas is that in Acts chapter 1, it says Judas, when he died, he went to his own place. Judas went to his own place. Zechariah chapter 11, verse 17. Do y'all remember whenever we were studying that the, the, in Revelation 13 that Whenever the Antichrist gets assassinated, he takes, a, he takes a deadly wound to the head. And evidently, it's, it, it, the Bible says it's by a sword. And that sword comes down and hits him and, and takes out his eye and takes out his arm. And, that sword, and it looks like it kills him and the, the Antichrist resurrects. And when the Antichrist resurrects, this is a prophecy of that. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. And his arm shall be clean dried up. And his right eye shall be utterly darkened. So evidently that sword comes down on his right eye. It hits him right here. And it hits his arm. And it shrivels up his arm. And his right eye shrivels up. And then he comes back up. And that's when he becomes the devil incarnate. That's when he resurrects. That's about halfway through the tribulation period. Y'all remember that? Take that, those verses we studied. So then we turn to Jeremiah chapter 48. And I'm, I'm going to throw these up here and we'll read them together. You might want to write these down and go home and read them yourselves. Because I'm not going to be turning to the Bible a whole lot. We're going to stay right here in Revelation 17 for time's sake. So in Jeremiah chapter 48 verse 24. It, uh, God's talking here and he says, Upon Kiroth and upon Basra and upon all the cities of the land of Moab far or near. The horn of Moab is cut off and his arm is broken, saith the Lord. So... What makes this interesting is Kerioth is out of Moab. Is out of Moab. Judas Iscariot, Iscariot, that last name of Judas Iscariot means, Iscariot means, Iscariot means, is Kerioth from Kerioth. So Judas was from the same area of Kerioth right here. But in the Greek it was Kerioth. So it's Iscariot means Judas of Kerioth, or you'd say like Kigan of Indian Gap, or or a Hank of Gustine, or whatever. That's, how, that's what this is saying. So Jude, because there was two Judases, remember? Of the disciples. So the, the way they'd say it is Judas of Scariot, of Kerioth. And notice here, this prophecy in Jeremiah chapter 48 says, Upon Kerioth, which Kerioth is of Moab, the horn of Moab is cut off, and his arm is broken, saith the Lord, which is a direct reference to Zechariah eleven seventeen 17, or the Antichrist. Kerioth is obviously here in Moab. And of course the horn, the horn in the Bible in Daniel chapter 7 
is the Antichrist. It describes the Antichrist. That horn rises up and that horn speaks great marvelous things. And that's what uh, Daniel's asking the angel. Like, who is that little horn that pops up? And here's the prophecy of the horn of Moab. He's cut off. He's been took out. And his arm is broken. And then it says his arm should be clean dried up. So there's something going on there where there's an association with Judas and the Antichrist. Judas and the Antichrist. I'm not saying 100% that the Antichrist is Judas come back, but there's some real great association in the Bible between the two of them. Is the Antichrist Judas return? So let's go back to, to Revelation 17, 8. Let's read this again. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend. So it says the Antichrist or that beast, he was... And then he was not or he is not. And then he yet is. See that at the end of verse 8? When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. That's a strange way of saying that. So let's break this down. The beast that was and is not and yet is. Let's break this down. So if Judas is the return of the Antichrist, or the Antichrist is the return of Judas, excuse me, was as Judas... He was as Judas. He is not because Judas went to his own place. According to Peter, when he died, he went to his own place. He is not, yet he is. He is as the Antichrist. He yet is as the Antichrist. Let's look at the seven kings. Verse 9. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. And, he's, and this is the angel as he continued uh, interpreting in those verses. Here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. All right, wow, there's a lot in there in verse 10. Now you're seeing why I said... It took us how many years to go through the book of Revelation? Like, I'm trying to do this in a 35-minute sermon, and this is really like a, probably a four- or five-hour study. But I'm trying to give it to you all, because so, I want to give this to you, because I know some of y'all can't make it into Sunday school. Some of y'all can't make it up to Wednesday night service. That's why I started trying to preach Revelation on the Sunday service. So it says five are fallen. So the five are fallen, those are five kingdoms. Five, seven kings, five are fallen. So there's been... There's been seven king. There's going to be seven kingdoms. So five have already fallen. So the first one will first one will be Egypt, and that'd be with Pharaoh. So after Egypt fell, Assyria came up, and that's Sennacherib. The third kingdom that came up was Babylon. That's Nebuchadnezzar. Y'all know the story of Nebuchadnezzar with Babylon. And then the fourth kingdom rise up, Media and the Persians. They took over for Babylon. They took over the Babylonian kingdom, and that was Cyrus. That king was Cyrus. The fifth one that showed up was Alexander the Great, and that was the Greece, the Greece kingdom. So you have Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, the five kingdoms. And then it says, and there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is. One is, right now. So that one is, right here, that one is, would be Rome. At that time, when Caesar was in power, Rome was in power when John wrote the book of Revelation. So you have the five kingdoms, and then one is, there it is in Rome. And he is, and, uh, and the other is not yet come, and that would be the Antichrist. Other is not yet come is the Antichrist before his daily wound. So the first three and a half years, the Antichrist comes in, he brings peace. The, the Christians are raptured out, the church is raptured out, all the troublemakers are gone. The Antichrist brings in world peace. He's trying to bring in peace, peace, but there'll be no peace. And the Antichrist, the seventh one. It's before he gets assassinated, before he takes that deadly wound, or the first three and a half years of the tribulation period. So there's a seven-year tribulation period after the rapture. The first three and a half years, the Antichrist is there. And then somewhere about halfway through, about halfway through that three, three and a half years, somebody tries to kill the Antichrist, assassinate him. And with that sword, and we just read that in Zechariah, go back to Revelation 13. It's all in Revelation 13 also. He takes that deadly wound to the head. So what you're reading there is, let's read verse 10 again. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. I just give them to you. One is, that's Caesar in Rome. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, that, be the, that would be the Antichrist, he, cometh, he must continue a short space. That short space is three and a half years. He must continue a short space, three and a half years. And then verse 11. Let's pick it up at verse 11. And the beast that was and is not 
Even he is the eighth. There's one, the eighth, and is of the seven. The eighth one comes out of the seventh one. And goeth into perdition. And of course, perdition is the son of perdition, is the Antichrist and Judas. See the association there again. Even he is the eighth and is of the seven. So, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. I have it up here on the screen. So that's the Antichrist, the eighth one, the eighth king is going to be the Antichrist after his deadly wound and healing. That's that last three and a half years when he, Satan incarnates him. That's when Jesus Christ says that's great tribulation. That's when it, the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple. That's when Satan evidently gets assassinated. He's laid there in the temple there on the temple mount and he resurrects. And when Satan resurrects, he says, I'm God, worship me. And all the Jews, they flee Jerusalem. And then Satan starts killing them by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. And then that's when the, Satan is just brings the whole world under control and starts telling the whole world, I'm God, worship me. That's back in Thessalonians. So it appears in verses 10 and 11, he's describing those seven kings or those seven heads or kings. And that's what we have going on here. It's the Antichrist before his deadly ruin. Other, others not yet come. The beast that was is not even he is the eighth. Is the eighth. The eighth one is Antichrist after his deadly wound. Y'all got it all? Because I don't. I have to study it and study it and study it and study it. But it's all right there. Let's move on before we, our minds go boom. All right, ten horns equal ten kings. Look at chapter, uh, verse 12. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Now notice, he describes a woman, and is, she's on a beast, and she, it has seven heads and ten horns, but notice the Bible's describing, telling you, that that's figurative because that, 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 that image he's seeing is representing ten kingdoms and ten, and ten kings and ten king, five, seven kings. It's representing people. And it's telling you exactly what that image represents. And he says there in verse 12, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast or unto the Antichrist. So these ten kings rise up and they give all the power and all their power to the Antichrist to run the world. But verse 14. These shall make war with the Lamb. That would be the battle of Armageddon. We know the Lamb to be Jesus Christ. And the Lamb shall overcome them. Why? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Amen. You got the right one in Jesus Christ. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Amen. I talked about faithfulness, didn't I, already? Faithfulness. There's something to do. There's something to be just being faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the end of verse 14 again. And they that are with him. Are you with him? Are you against him? Amen. One of the two. This is when the preaching starts. <laughs> Are you with him or against him? My testimony is I'm with him. I'm with Jesus Christ. Wherever he goes, I'll follow. That we sing those songs? I'm with him. Because he's done so much for me. You might have your king, but my king is the king of kings. You might have your lord you bow down to, but my lord is the lord of lords. And they that are with him, are you with him or are you against him? Verse 15, And he saith unto me, the angel saith unto him, The waters which thou sawest, remember that beast comes out of the waters with that whore on it? The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. That's the whole world. That represents the whole world. So waters in the Bible represents the whole world. The sea there. Verse 16, And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. They're going to hate that whore that's riding that beast. And she'll make her desolate and naked. And she'll eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Destroys her. So those ten kings, they hate that whore. And they're going to destroy that whore according to the Bible. For God, verse 17, hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will. See, God uses, can use kings that are gent lost Gentile kings. He can use them to get his will done. 
Do you know God's getting His will done through Biden right now? Amen. We are getting exactly what we deserve in America. You know who's a bigger idiot than Biden? Harris. That's only Kamala Harris is probably a bigger idiot than him. You better hope that Biden doesn't something doesn't happen to Biden. We'll be in worse shape under her. I mean, y'all are quiet in here. Does y'all vote for them or what? Listen, they're all idiots. This this will put us all on eleven. I I don't like them any of them. But we get who we deserve, and for God to put in their hearts to fulfill His will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast, the Antichrist, until what? The words of God shall be fulfilled. God does what He's doing in the White House to get this book fulfilled. He brings in these people that you go, why in the world are they doing it? Who would do any of that? Why would they do that? Because God gets them to do that because He wants something done in Israel. And he, wants, he wants this world system to get set up. He wants, this all, he wants the economy to be in the shape it's in. So he brings in that one world currency. When he brings in that currency that's cashless. And you have to go back to this one cashless society. This is all this, that's what all this is working toward. So he can bring in the Antichrist and set the Antichrist up. So why, In the end, so he can bring in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's doing there. Put in their hearts to fulfill His will. Words of God shall, shall be fulfilled. Not maybe. Shall be fulfilled. This book's going to happen. Those ten kings. The ten horns are prophesied in the book of Daniel. So remember in the book of Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar had his dream. He had his dream of a statue and the gold, the, gold, the silver, the brass, the bronze, the iron. So what... Uh, what those represented, Daniel gave him the interpretation. Daniel said, that represents, that gold represents you. This represents the Medes and the Persian, the arm, the silver, and then the brass and bronze. That represents Greece or Alexander the Great, and then the Roman Empire. And then at the end, there's ten toes. And those are the world empires to come. I just, I just listed them out for you. And then he said at the end there's a great rock that comes down out of the heavens that's made, not made by man's hands that comes down and destroys the feet, destroys those ten kingdoms. That rock is Jesus Christ. That rock is the, is the, king, is the millennial kingdom. That's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Peter, uh, Paul says the rock was Jesus Christ. That's the Christ. That's how Nebuchadnezzar's dream was given to him by God. And those ten toes represent those ten kings that we're just reading about right there. Right there, those ten toes. Now, also, Daniel was given the same type of vision, but instead of Daniel seeing the vision as a great statue, Daniel was seeing the, given the vision by God as these wild beasts. And this, this, the first beast was this represented, this lion here with the wings represented Babylon. This repre th then the Medes and the Persians come along as the bear. And then the, the Grecian, the leopard, that represented Alexander the Great, the Greece. And then this one world religious empire comes in the antichrist this wild beast he couldn't even describe it this is the way the artist drew it but on that beast remember it had ten horns a ten federated kingdom ten kings a ten federated kingdom and that's how that's how he was given the vision by god and out of those ten horns came up one little horn is the antichrist and i've, I've went through a lot of that with y'all lately Remember, he's called a little horn. Do you know that Napoleon was only about this tall? Little horn. You know Hitler was only about this tall? Little bitty old guys. You ever heard that little man complex type thing? And the Bible says it's the little man. He's a little horn. Makes you wonder. These world, these world rulers that, con that conquer the whole world, they're little bitty guys. Watch out for the little guys. <laughs> I'm just joking. Some of y'all need to lighten up some in here. I'm just messing around. The ten horns are ten kings. Let's look this over and then we'll move on. These ten kings have no kingdom. So it's not like it's not America. It's not like British. It's not the European Union. They don't have a kingdom. That they, they, they receive power as kings. They're not kings, but they receive power as kings. So it's not like necessarily they've been crowned kings by a nation. They just receive power as kings. See that? All that's in Revelation 17, 12. So likely this is a secret society group of politicians and leaders behind the scenes. 
which we, are, we know probably today as like the Trilateral Commission, the Bilderberg Group, the Illuminati's Society. They have all these different, people say there's a secret society running the world. They're probably right. Now, we don't know who these ten people are, and you always have people trying to figure out who are the ten kings. It could be this, it could be that, it could be, it, they, they have all this, they, they try to get all the, guys, you're wasting your time. I really believe, now, you might could figure it out, I don't know. But I think it's going to be a secret society. I don't think you're going to know who it is that's behind, uh, behind the Antichrist. They're kind of behind the scenes. And they're giving all their power to the Antichrist. Anybody heard the last name Rockefeller? See, a lot of younger guys, like I bet Gibson's probably never heard the name. Have you ever heard the name Rockefeller? He says, no, I've never heard the name Rockefeller. Well, Rockefeller pretty much owns everything. They run everything. They've run everything. They're behind the scenes. So if you wanted me to say, name one of them, it's probably the Rockefellers or some of them running behind the scenes. We know Bill Gates is probably running things behind the scenes. Has Bill Gates got an empire? Has he got a kingdom? No. But he's as a king. His, does, does Bill Gates have power as a king right now? Yes, he does. I'm not going to get into it. They'll kick me off Facebook. But if you don't know enough about what Bill Gates is doing, you need to go on to Google and just Google it up. It's all right there. All right, let's move on. Imagery of the woman on the beast around the world. So what's interesting about this image of the woman that you read about the mystery of the woman that's riding the beast is you'll find this all over the world, this imagery of her. So on the European Union coins, you'll find this image of the woman riding the beast. So this is Europa, and the story, the, 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 uh, the mythological tale goes that Zeus, he incarnated himself into a bull because he, he loved this woman, Europa. He, loved, he wanted to have her as his wife, so he incarnated himself into a bull, and then he come and stole her away. So that's the imagery of that, but that's the imagery of the woman on the beast. You'll see that all over Europe, they have statues all over Europe of the woman on the beast. Just like this. There's some more of that there. And it's all European Union stuff. It's all on their stamps. See the stamps? Woman on the beast. On the coins. That's European Union stuff. What's interesting about the European Union is they got a, they got a parliament. And at the European Parliament, this is the, this is the building for the European Parliament, the EU Parliament. And they designed it just like the Tower of Babel. This Tower of Babel where they're trying to reach them to heaven and God came down and destroyed them and, and confused the languages. They did their building and it's designed just like the Tower of Babel. That's just, it's Babylonian worship. That's what it is. All this stuff is Babylonian worship. And the reason why we don't know more about it is because they're not teaching it to us in the schools. And you've got to find out, you've got to study your own history to find this stuff out. It's all right in there. Stuff like the beauty and the beast, that's all that, uh, the woman and the beast, the whore and the beast, that's all, that kind of imagery is all through the, uh, society. Even at the, one of the latest Super Bowls, uh, Katy Perry, the singer, came out and she was riding this, look at this, she's riding this beast, the whore and the beast. Katy Perry is, is, is a, I, I'm going to call her a Satanist, I don't know if she'd call herself a Satanist, she's definitely wicked, 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 but she's a preacher's daughter. She's a preacher's daughter. And she's riding this beast that is at halftime. Watch for this stuff. You'll see this stuff in society now. The mystery of the woman is solved. The Bible solves it for us if we study it together. Clue number one. Go back. Clue number one. Go back to verse four. Let's read verse 4 together. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So the first clue is that her colors are purple and red and she's rich. Her colors are purple and red and she has a cup full of abominations. See where this is going? The mystery is not that hard to figure out. First clue is, is the color, her colors are purple and scarlet. And she's got a golden cup. She's full of abomination and filthiness of her fornication. Roman Catholic Church. Second clue to that is, she, verse 6, it says there, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. She's martyred and spilled the blood of Christians for centuries. This great whore has. 
The St. Bartholomew Day Massacre was when the Catholics came in and destroyed about 30,000, killed about 30,000 Huguenots. Huguenots were believers just like me and you, Bible believers. They didn't believe what the Catholics taught. We, they were more like what the people would call Protestants. But if you read this article, I'll pull this article up, they don't mention one mention of the Catholic Church, not one mention. And they killed about 30,000 of people that day. That's just, one that's just one example. The Crusades, they came through, the, the Pope started the Crusades, the Catholic Church started the Crusades, they came in killing people by the thousands, maybe upwards of millions of going down here to Jerusalem, killing them in the name of Jesus Christ, martyring people, uh, believers. Some of them were Bible believers, just like me and you, that believed this book. We didn't believe, what the, we didn't believe in the Pope as our authority. Here's a picture of the Pope, preaches the first crusade, here they are, the crusaders running through, killing people, destroying. Some of it was destroying the Muslims, fighting Islam, trying to gain back Jerusalem, trying to make a kingdom, a physical kingdom. That physical kingdom is not going to come here until Jesus Christ comes back. The Spanish Inquisition, the Inquisitions. The Spanish Inquisition is, is described as the Inquisition was a group of institutions within the government system of the Catholic Church whose aim was to combat public heresy committed by baptized Christians. Baptized Christians is somebody who says, I, don't, I think you have to be baptized to be saved. Not necessarily that teaching, but baptized Christians would teach that to be saved, you had to, they believed in what we'd call believer's baptism. Let me say that again. They believed in believer's baptism. In other words, you don't get baptized until you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8. And the Catholics were trying to kill people for that. That's me and you. We're called Baptists for a reason. We're called Baptists because we believe you've got to be baptized before you, you got to be saved before you can get baptized. So a Catholic will do is a Catholic will take a little baby and they'll sprinkle it and baptize it into the church and that baby's part of that church Catholic system and then that baby's saved inside that church as long as it's keeping the ordinances, keeping all the stuff the Catholic church teaches. So they would kill people for these public heresies. Here they are torturing people in all these different ways. And you can see here there's a crucifix with the Bible opened up here on this table while they're torturing people and killing them by the thousands. Clue number three, verse 18. Read verse 18 with me. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The great city that reigns over the city of the kings of the earth. So if you go back to verse 9, it tells us about that, that, that city. Verse 9, and here's the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. That city sits on seven mountains or hills. So Rome is a city of seven hills. The city of seven hills of Rome. This is not that great a mystery, guys. And the church, is since, uh, since the Roman Catholic Church came into to being in about 200 A.D. to 300 A.D., this has been taught by Christians all over the world for almost 2,000 years. That the Roman Catholic system you see today is the whore that rides the beast, rides the Antichrist. It's solved. Not much of a mystery, the Roman Catholic Church. So we know the Roman Catholic Church is tied to Babylon. There's the Dysonimerus and Samarius, Ninus, just like Mary and the baby Jesus. They're just copying Babylonian religion is what they're doing. And we know if you know anything about the Catholic system, it sets Mary up. See how Mary has the rod of power and Jesus is under her and she's in control. That's the Roman Catholic system. It's the whore that rides the beast. It's the worship of a woman. It's the worship of a woman. It's what it is. It's feminine. It's a feminine spirit. That's all it is. That's all the Catholic Church is. You go to Jesus. Jesus goes to Mary. and Mary does, Jesus, You go to Mary and Mary tells Jesus what to do because every good son does what the mother tells him. So that's why, that's the Catholic image. You bow down to the statue of Mary. That's Catholic, Catholicism. I've shown you all this before, but the head of uh, Dagon, the fish god, here's the, the, the Dagon priest, they would wear a, a hat like this that looked like a fish. That's why that Pope has that weird looking hat on like this. It's all Babylonian. It's all Babylonian nonsense, guys. It's all just, it's all paganism. Catholicism is all paganism. John Hagee, back in 2008, when, when uh, John McCain was running for president, he, he taught what I'm teaching you this morning until he started endorsing John McCain. 
John Hagen, the influential televangelist who endorsed John McCain, is apologizing to Catholics for referring to the Roman Catholic Church as the great whore. He taught exactly what I taught out of the book of Revelation, which is what is in right there. You got it in your lap. It's not too hard to figure out. Well, he was teaching that, but as soon as he endorsed John McCain, then everybody started going nuts, and he had to apologize. He had to, he had to write a letter. And he goes, I want to, he goes, uh, in a letter, he says, out of a desire to advance a greater unity among Catholics and evangelicals and promoting the common good, there's nothing that Catholic and evangelical can get together about. They, teach a, they preach a different gospel. They teach a different Jesus Christ. It's not the same thing. And if you don't believe that, you don't know your Bible. The letter, and then he got together with 22 religious leaders. They were all, almost all of them were Catholics. Virtually all of them were Catholics. He wrote this letter apologizing. And he said, Hagee has cited the Inquisition and the Crusades as evidence of anti-Semitism within the Catholic Church, which is why I just showed you. And that suggested that Catholic anti-Semitism shaped Adolf Hitler's views of Jews. And it did. Adolf Hitler was a devout Catholic and their views of the Jews helped shape Adolf Hitler's view of the Jews. That's why he killed six million of them. Go read history. The Catholic Church helped the Nazis escape Germany. Go read history. This isn't something that's just hidden somewhere. So he writes this letter and he said, hey, God, hey he wrote, In the process, I may have contributed to the mistaken impression that the anti-Jewish violence of the Crusades and Inquisition defines the Catholic Church. It most certainly does not. It most certainly does define the Catholic Church because they haven't changed. This is what bothers me the most. This paragraph right here. Hagee has often made references to the apostate church, that's the Catholic Church, and the great whore, terms that Catholics say are slurs aimed at Roman Catholic Church. In his letter, Hagee said he now better understood that the book of Revelation's reference, you're reading it with me, the book of Revelation's reference to the Catholic Church as the apostate church and the great whore are a rhetorical device long employed in anti-Catholic literature and commentary. It's been long employed and used because that's what it is. And he got yellow-bellied because he's trying to get into politics, which he should have never have done. He should have stayed out of politics, but he's trying to get John McCain into office and he should have left it alone. And he had to compromise. Because you can't, when you get into politics, when you get into the world, the world system is run by the Catholics. And in a statement by the Catholic lead website, Donahue said, what Hagee has done takes courage. No, I call it cowardice. You can call it courage. I call it cowardice. And quite frankly, I never expected him to demonstrate such sensitivity. He didn't expect him to roll over and show his belly is what it was. Guys, if you don't know anything about Roman Catholicism, this is the one thing I want y'all to remember this morning. I'm about to close. I'm going to show you some slides. You need to remember that the only reason you got this book is because people were fighting against the Catholics. You've got an English Bible in your lap. No thanks. Absolutely no thanks are to the Catholics. It's because of men like John Wycliffe. It's going to be a man like William Tyndale I'm about to show you that died so you could have a Bible in your own language and they were trying to keep it from you. Why would the Catholics not want you to have a Bible? Because what they teach you doesn't come out of the Bible. That's why they don't want you having a Bible. And that's, that's, the, that's the main reason to fight against the Catholics right there. He's the morning star of the Reformation. He's known as the morning star of the Reformation. John Wycliffe is quoted saying, where the Bible and the church, that'd be the Catholic church, do not agree. And when it says, when the Bible and Indian Gap or the Catholic church or the church of Christ or the Methodist church or the Presbyterian church, when any church doesn't agree with the Bible, we must obey the Bible. Amen. Don't, don't listen to what I say. Don't listen to what Indian Gap says or the Baptist Convention or the Methodist Church or the Catholic Church. Listen to what the Bible says and where conscience and human authority, that would be the Catholic Church at the time, are in conflict, we must follow conscience. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Wycliffe is quoted as saying, the gospel alone is sufficient to rule the lives of Christians everywhere. The gospel alone. Any additional rules made to govern men's conduct 
added nothing to the perfection already found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing the Catholic Church can give you. There's nothing Indian Gap, can give, Indian Gap Baptist can give you. Only the Bible through the gospel of Jesus Christ, it's the only thing you need to lean on. That doesn't sit well with the Catholics. They went after him. He was trying to translate this Bible into English. And they went after him and they tried to kill him. They summoned him to a council before the, before the priests and the bishops. And he was summoned and he appeared before the council. And White, Whitecliffe rebuked the bishops for being priests of Baal. And I showed it to you already. You're priests of Baal selling blasphemy and idolatry in the mass and in indulgences. He called them out. That's why they didn't like him. Forty-four years later after he died, the Pope buried, unburied his bones, dug them up, and they burned, burned all his bones and spread his ashes in the river, and they burned all of Whitecliffe's writings. That's the Catholic Church going against Bible believers. Whitecliffe was a Bible believer like what you are in this church. You're a Bible believer. William Tyndale, one of the great men of history. William Tyndale I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life, ere many years, I will cause a boy that driveth the plow to know more of the Scripture than he does. Amen, amen. Some of y'all in here know more of your Bible than the Pope does. And if you don't believe that, you need to get to know the Pope. A bishop was arguing with him and seen a plow boy and the bishop was arguing with him about, who, about how man, the common man doesn't need a Bible. The common man doesn't need to know the Bible. The common man doesn't need to read his Bible. And Whitecliffe got mad and that's when Whitecliffe said that. So Whitecliffe started, started translating the Bible into English, trying to get the Bible into your hands and the Catholic Church was going after him trying to kill him. William Tyndale was re remembered for his translation of the Bible into English. For this, the Catholic Church killed him. I didn't write that. This, somebody else wrote this. He was tried for heresy, choked, impaled, and burnt on a stake in 1536 by the Catholic Church for trying to get a Bible into English. You're going to trust the Catholic Church? You go right on ahead. I'm not trusting the Catholic Church. In my mind, the Catholic Church is a great whore. He's the, she's defined right there in Revelation 17. God bless William Tyndale while he was on the stake as he's impaled and they're choking him to death. The last words of William Tyndale were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes as they burned him alive. Lord, open the king of England's eyes as he burned in flame. Less than 50 years later, you have this book in your lap. It's written. The book that's in your lap, 50 years later, the same is translated. 1611. 400 years later, you're still reading it. You're still believing it. You're still trusting it in Jesus Christ to get you to heaven. You're you know the Jesus you trust is out of this book right here. And it's no thanks to the Catholic Church. If it was the Catholic Church's view, you wouldn't have a Bible in your lap. You'd still be under the authority of a Catholic Church. But thank God men like this were willing to die and to bleed to give you that book. And we won't hardly read it every day. And it wasn't just men, it was women sacrificing their life, dying. Women and children trying to get these scriptures as they were printed, trying to spread the Bible all over the known world. And the Catholic Church was going against them. If you've got a good English King James Bible, at the first there's a dedicatory by the translators. And in that dedication of the translators, it talks in that dedication about it talks about the Pope. It talks about the Popish people. And it talks about uh, getting away from Popish people. It's all in there. If you've got one, a, good, a good King James Bible, it'll have it in there. And, it'll talk, and it talks about the, the King James translators were talking about Popish people. People trying to control you through authority, through things. Don't let anybody control you. Brothers and sisters, let me close by saying this. And I know I'm, I'm running a little long, but let me close by saying this. You've got liberty in Jesus Christ. Don't let me take that liberty away from you. Don't let the government take that liberty away from you. Don't let the Catholic Church take that liberty away from you. Don't let anybody, don't let your parents, don't let your mom and dad, don't let your husband or spouse, don't let anybody take that liberty you have in Jesus Christ away from you. 
Man, guys, you got the most beautiful thing, the most beautiful liberty. It was Patrick Henry, a Baptist preacher, a Baptist preacher, a street preaching Baptist preacher who said, give me liberty or give me death. Give me liberty or give me death. And we have men and women before us that followed the same path as Bible believers. They chose death. They said, you know what? If you're not going to give me my liberty, I'll, I'll, I'll just rather die in Jesus Christ. They're great whores in the Roman Catholic Church. And John Hagee rolled over like a, like a yellow cow dog for politics. Makes me sick at my stomach. We got to keep fighting the fight, brothers and sisters. We got to keep fighting the fight. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your, your grace and your mercy, Lord. I thank you for this Bible, Lord, that was written to us in this English language, Lord, that we can read it and study it and believe in Jesus Christ and put our faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord,